Welcome to the Jungets Games Impressions Vlog. Today I'll be discussing five new games that I've played recently, and I'll be going through them in alphabetical order. Now before we move on, I would like to ask that if you enjoy this video, you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Also, if you would like to directly support the channel and the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. There you'll find a bunch of ways that you can really help things out, and some of them come with pretty cool perks like voting on a couple of the videos that I film each month. Alright, let's now start talking about games, and the first one of these is Alubari, A Nice Cup of Tea. Now, I played this one twice at Board Game Geek Con just a couple of weeks ago, and it's my understanding that this is effectively a standalone expansion game to Snowdonia, which came out back in 2012. Now, Alubari is a new release that just came out at uh, Essen Spiel this year, and I have not played Snowdonia or any of the Snowdonia stuff in the past. So for me, Alubari was a very new game overall, although I did do a little bit of research, and it seems like um, a lot of what I'm about to say does apply to Snowdonia, but I'm specifically going to talk about Alubari. Uh, now, as I said before, I did play this game two times, and uh, that goes to show that I wanted to play this one a second time, and I'll explain why in a little bit, but let's first cover some of the basics of the mechanics. Now, this is a worker placement style game where each player starts off with two workers, and you'll have two workers for most of the rounds of the game. Uh, now, the way this works is in player order, you're going to put one worker out onto one of the worker placement spots, which is uh, a list of cards along the top, or the board itself, depending on the player count. Now, when you place a worker down, you don't immediately activate the spot. Instead, the next person goes, and then when it comes back around to you, you put your next worker down, and once all of them are played on the board, you then evaluate each one of the worker placement spots in order going down the line. Now, the first spot lets you um, uh, get some resources. There is some iron, there is also some stone, as well as chai, which is a resource that you can gather. Uh, the second location um, let you, I believe, uh, excavate uh, to actually uh, clear spaces for more uh, buildings to get built. I'm not really sure the thematic integration right over there. Oh, no, I know. It's it's plantations. You're building plantations to grow tea. So you have to excavate those, and in order to do that, you use shovels, and it gives you rubble, and rubble is a resource that you can actually spend later. Now, the third worker placement spot lets you turn rubble into stone, or stone into rubble at a conversion rate, and more importantly, you can turn three iron into one steel. Now, this is important because the fourth worker placement spot lets you actually place steel down onto the board as track, as railroad track, and you start at one end of this line and you build all the way over, and every time you build out a spot, that's going to be worth points to you at the end of the game, but also when you get to certain spots along this track, you're going to unlock new stations that can be constructed with the next worker placement spot. Now, that one is going to cost you steel sometimes, uh, rubber and stone, uh, rubber, rubble and stone are also a couple of the resources you can spend to build stations, which give you one-shot perks or victory points at the end of the game. So, so as you can see, as you're going through these worker placement actions, they all kind of feed into each other. You get resources, and then you convert those resources. Uh, you excavate to get rubble, and then you want to lay steel and do all of this stuff. Now, later on, you can also do a worker placement spot, which gives you contracts. And these are important because they give you a one-shot, really nice ability, and every contract gives you an end-game conditional uh, thing that you're going for to get points. Uh, maybe one of them says you have to build out three railroad tracks and also have three T lying around. Um, if you do that at the end of the game, you get extra points. Uh, there's another one that maybe says you have to get five of the uh, plantations built out by the end of the game, so it gives you another thing to chase after as you're playing the game. Uh, now, um, lastly, the last spot on the, the board lets you uh, gather some tea, or it lets you turn tea into chai. Now, specifically, tea leaves into chai, which is the tea that you drink. Now, this is important because chai is a resource that, again, you could gather in the first worker placement spot, and it's effectively like the, the Popeye spinach in this game, where uh, you will gather up chai, and it's worth points at the end of the game, but you are more likely going to want to spend your chai to superpower your actions. Um, if you have specific uh, equipment that you've bought, then you can spend chai to unlock a third worker uh, for an individual round. You lose them at the end of the round. You can also spend chai to make every one of these actions better. Um, you harvest more stuff. You dig more stuff. You lay more track. You um, uh, see more contracts. There's just a wide variety of things you can do by spending this chai, so getting it is good. Now, in this game, there is a weather mechanism, and it's my understanding that there was a weather mechanism in Snowdonia, the original game as well, but I'm not sure how exactly uh, they differ, but this is a very important mechanic to talk about um, for reasons I'll get to in a minute. 
Now, um, you effectively see a forecast in the future. There's uh, the weather of this turn, and then you can see what's coming the next round and the round after that. Um, now, the weather that comes out is based off of kind of a random draw from the top of the deck, and it's going to either be sunny, it will be rainy, or it's going to be foggy. Now, whenever the weather changes, which happens at the beginning of each round, it's going to alter how the game plays. Um, if it is sunny, then it's going to dry things up, and you will be uh, better able to uh, lay down track and excavate some things. Um, if it is foggy, then the inverse happens. Um, if it's wet, then it's really hard to lay track and excavate, so those are going to get harder to do, but it's going to cause the uh, tea leaves to grow, so you're going to move a tea leaf track over. And there are a couple spots on these tracks that uh, go up and down as the weather fluctuates, uh, where if you get to the end, which again is random based off of the cards, but if it gets to the end of one of these tracks, then there's a harvest, and you harvest up tea based off of a modifier multiplied by the number of plantations that you built out by excavating those spots. And tea, again, is important because you can turn it into chai, which lets you superpower your actions. So obviously this stuff is quite cyclical. Now, the, the thing about weather is that it's random. What's going to come out? And there's these three different types. And at this point, I'm going to shift into talking about my impressions of the game because I've covered a large part of the overall mechanics of the game. Um, now, when you're playing this game, when fog comes out specifically, this is what I want to harp on, um, you are not going to be able to lay track or uh, excavate. It's just too foggy. You can't do it. And a uh, thing happened in both of my plays where a lot of fog came out randomly. In our first play, we had three fog come out in a row, which meant that was three turns where you could not lay track and you could not... Um, uh, excavate. And the key here is that the game ends once the entire train line is full. That's the only way this game ends. So the end game condition was getting put off by this random chance of having a fog bank come in. So three full rounds happen as we start to build up and we're like getting a bunch of iron and we're turning it into steel. We're waiting for the fog bank to break. And the moment it did, we just built a ton of track and the game ended the next round. Now that's fine. It's kind of an okay uh, uh, result from some random variances in the game. But what we saw in this play was uh, one person kind of abused the starting player mechanic with this in mind. Um, now, there's a specific spot that's a pretty low power spot at the beginning of one of the worker placement spots that lets you take the starting player uh, token. Now, the moment the fog uh, was going to break, we could see finally sun's coming out and not fog, um, the player who was the current start player went on that spot with their very first action out of two, or maybe three actions, to claim the starting player's uh, uh, token. Now that meant the next round, when it's still foggy, they were the starting player, and the first action went to that spot to claim the starting player token. So the next round that was still foggy, they were still the starting player, but they kept camping the spot so that when it was finally sunny, because they saw it coming three turns out, they were the starting player, and they just built a ton of track. And um, then the person to their left was a bit fortunate. They built a bunch more track. And then the person all the way to the right of the starting player who just camped on that starting player token for rounds and rounds, they had no space to actually build track, which uh, meant they didn't have much to do with their iron. I guess you could, or their uh, steel, you could spend it getting equipment, which also gets you points. But it was just a strange situation considering many of the contract goals that you're going for require you to have built out a certain amount of track. Uh, the actual track themselves just gives you like three or four points, but maybe you have a contract that's going to give you like 31 points if you get three of the, uh, the uh, uh, track out as well as doing some other things, and you have two track out right now, and you just need one more, but the person um, to your left is camping this out, and they're all going to be gone, and there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, that's what happened in the first play. I was one track away based off of um, how the starting player uh, worked out and how the track maxed out, and uh, I switched gears and I did other things and I actually ended up winning the game, but it felt a little weird, like a degenerate game state. Now, we played this game a second time and we did that because, well, the first game was pretty... <laughs> We, we felt a little weird about it. Like, it was really long because we uh, had read the rules uh, right there, and so it just took, you know, probably an hour uh, to uh, read the rules and teach what was going on before we actually started playing this game, which is relatively simple. And then the actual play took, like, two hours, and it really seemed like um, one of the people we were playing with was just playing a little bit uh, slower than one of the other people, so it just it kind of dragged the game out. And we were like, it wasn't a very satisfying experience, but I felt like there was a 
or a fun gaming experience in there. I, I felt like, well, that fog bank thing was weird, and people were maybe, maybe playing slow. We weren't really familiar with it. I'd like to try it again. So that's why we played this a second time, because I wanted to, to give it another shot. Now, in the second play, we got right into it quickly because we taught it quite uh, uh, fast, and this was actually only a three-player game. And in this play, we had a fog bank come out of four in a row. That was four rounds where you could not do the things that pushed the end game. Uh, and what ended up happening is I actually abused the starting player thing. Um, I spent chai because I had a bunch of chai to get extra workers to make up for the fact that I had kind of a lackluster worker placement action to do that. And I had contracts which were going to give me a lot of points for the track that I laid. Um, and I ended up winning that game. And we again had this um, situation where the track wasn't even halfway done. We had this fog bank come in of five. And then by the time it um, came out of that, the game just ended in the very next round. So I, I came away from these plays feeling like, I don't know, maybe this game should have had some sort of a limit. Like you can never have more than two weather in a row of a type to try and stop this um, strange way that the game could end as it did with both of these plays. Now, um, I won both of the plays and I enjoyed the decisions I was making in both plays. I think it, it's a pretty cool game, honestly. Um, and if I had a copy of it, I would honestly uh, play around with a house rule of saying um, if the random uh, variable came out saying there's going to be a third sun or third rain or third fog, fog in particular, um, then you just don't. You just draw another card until you get a different type of weather. And I don't think the game would really uh, falter for it. And I think the overall gameplay would be a little bit more fluid and a little less weird because, again, the fog bank just blocks off certain worker placement spots. So now everyone is just kind of like stockpiling up. So, um, yeah, that's kind of how I feel about Alubaria. If that uh, fog bank situation had not happened, I feel like I would be uh, even more enthused about it. Um, but even as it is, I do think I'd like to play this again. It's It's got really neat systems. It's a simple worker placement type of game that lends itself to a lot of interesting decisions as you're trying to piece together your contracts and, you know, uh, uh, complete all the contracts that you're going for. Um, you're obviously trying to get plantations so that you harvest well. There's an entire event mechanism, which I'm not going to talk about, which I thought was really well implemented. So there's a lot of cool stuff going on here. Just a weird thing happened in both of our plays, and it makes me wonder, how often is that going to happen? Or is it just dumb luck we saw it twice? And it kind of uh, put a little bit of a fog bank on our overall opinion of the plays. All right, let's now move on to the second game, which is Aquatica. Now, much like Alubari, I played this one twice at Board Game Geek Con, and um, I'm going to say right from the outset that this was one of the better games I played at the convention. I really enjoyed this game. We played it a second time specifically because we liked the first play so much, and uh, somebody else kind of joined into the group, and we wanted them to experience it, so we played it just to show them, and uh, let's talk a little bit how it plays. Uh, now, in this game, uh, each person is, I guess, in charge of an underwater kingdom to a certain extent, and this game uses is a hand building uh, uh, mechanism that was very similar to Concordia. Now, I'm not going to assume that you've played Concordia, but I'm going to tell you right now that Concordia is one of my top 10 games. Um, probably of all time, I love Concordia, so I was predisposed to like it in this game. Now, what this means is, at the start of the game, you have a hand of, I believe, seven cards, and every single turn, you're just going to select one card from your hand and put it on the table. You then do what the card says, and then your turn is over, and when it's back to your turn again, you have less cards in your hand. Now, one of the cards you have in your hand, you play it out and it pulls all of your cards back up and there are ways to hire new cards into your system. And when you do that, they come right into your hand so that you can then play them and do some cool stuff. Now, all of that works just like Concordia, but um, in Aquatica, the uh, big thing that you're pushing to do in this game is not necessarily buy more cards. Like in Concordia, that's where the points are uh, uh, for a large part, or at least it's a multiplier, but I'm not going to go there. Uh, but in Aquatica, getting more uh, hired on people is just a means to an end of getting locations. Now, these locations are cards, and they have a series of little circular circles on them in rows. Now, when you uh, conquer a location, either by uh, purchasing it with money or by uh, conquering it with um, little pitchfork uh, trident things, uh, you take it and you put it onto your player board, and it's a double-layer player board with little gaps in between the two layers. Now, you put them up there, and you slide them up until you hit the first one of these rows, and now you get bonus actions with these locations, essentially. Um, if there is a money icon in that bubble, then that means the next time you want to spend money, you can push the location up one chunk to pull that money out. If it said plus two money, then you push it up, covering the plus two money. That action is gone, but you now have plus two money to add into the card that you play that gives you another money. You now have three money, and you can buy a location or maybe hire somebody. Um, there are also little icons for the uh, tridents, which help you conquer territories, and there are a variety of other actions. And so what this means 
means is this is a game about trying to take the territories that work for you and put them in front of you, and then you will use them in a very satisfying, combo-y way to pull off the things that you want to do. Um, so, for instance, you could push up two or three territories that all show money to get a whole bunch of money to purchase a really big, expensive territory to put into your area. Also, there are other things like a symbol with an arrow, with which, when you cover that up, lets you push up another one of your territories up. Now, that's important because some of these rows don't have a symbol on them. That means those territories just get kind of stuck at that point. So you have to have an ability that lets you push something else up to actually clear that spot. And the reason this is important is because the points in this game are all in those locations for the most part. Now, once you get a location pushed all the way up to the top so that there are no more rows showing, you then do a treasure chest action, either by playing a card from your hand that has a little treasure chest symbol, or by pushing up another location that shows a treasure chest. And that lets you cash out a location that is fully maxed out. So again, you have to push it all the way up to the front uh, by using its tiny little incremental bonuses as well as covering up its uh, uh, roadblocks. And then you take it and you put it into your treasure chest. It's now worth points to you. And sometimes they give mantas. Now, I haven't talked about this just yet, but at the start of the game, each player has four of these manta ray tokens. And all of them are flipped upside down and they show an ability. Now, as you're playing the game as a free action, you can flip over a manta to get the ability that's shown on the uh, underside of it. So there is one of them that you start with that has an arrow. So you can flip that manta over to push up one of your locations. There's another one that gets you uh, a coin. So you can use that to help buy things that you need. Uh, there's another one that gets you some uh, pitchforks, or again, uh, tridents. <laughs> and um, uh, that's just another way that you can use little uh, actions to build into big combo-y turns. You might find yourself playing down a card, flipping over two or three mantas, shoving up a couple of locations, and just doing this monster big turn because you've set all that up, and then now a location is pushed up, so now you can actually catch it out and do some cool stuff. Now again, locations let you get more manta rays, so you start with four of them, and you can kind of cultivate um, uh, other things, like some of them give you two money, some of them um, give you even better bonuses that I'm not going to go into the specifics of now, but you should have a decent idea of the flow of this game now, and in particular, the really satisfying way that you can set up really cool turns. Now, um, as I said before at the beginning, this has this Concordia-style hand-building and card-playing mechanic, but the star of this game is the location-pushing pushing mechanic and those mantas. Uh, in both of the plays of this game that I did, um, there were situations where uh, at least one person, uh, this happened to me definitely in the second play, where it was my turn and I did the thing, and then I pushed up this location to get some money to do the thing, and then I pushed this up lo location to push the previous one to clear a spot, and then I push another one, which actually maxes out another one. Now I'm going to... Uh, push this one over here, which uh, unlocks a treasure chest, to dump this thing over here, getting me a manta, which has another treasure chest symbol on it. So I'll flip over that new manta ray to cash in another one of these, which has an arrow that you'll flip over to push up another one. And you could just have this crazy combo turn where you're just doing all of the stuff and your opponents are just kind of watching you like, wow, that was a good turn. And then the dust settles and then the next person goes. Um, now, from my experience of playing this game twice, um, those big turns are somewhat rare. Usually you're just going to do a couple of these uh, side actions. And even if there is a big turn, usually downtime isn't really that big of a deal because you're thinking about what you're going to do next. And these games just went by at a decent clip. Um, the first play was three of us and the second play had four of us. And I don't think even the second play went 90 minutes. I think it was probably closer to an hour uh, when the game actually ended. So I was super impressed with this game. Um, it's It's got a lot of things that I like uh, with the Concordia type mechanisms, but then also these really satisfying ways to piece together really cool turns. The game does not overstay its welcome and it's got a nice underwater theme. The manta rays are these nice pieces that you flip over. They're very satisfying. And there's just a lot of stuff to like in this game. It's definitely a uh, medium weight game, but it's on the lighter end of medium weight games. But um, I don't currently have a copy of this game, but if I did, I would certainly see myself playing this one more. Um, it's relatively straightforward to teach, and uh, I do hope to have opportunities to get more plays of this one in the future. So let's now move on to game number three, and this one is Fast Sloths. Um, say that one three times fast. <laughs> now this is the new Friedman Freeze game, and it has a really funny theme. Uh, in this game, each player is a sloth, and a world with a whole bunch of animals running around. And we've all decided that we want to race as sloths, but we are sloths, which means we are really slow. We can't really move by ourselves. So the way this game works is you are spending cards on your turns to move around neutral animals of a wide variety of types. And you're trying to jump onto the backs of these animals and then use those animals to move you along to a spot so that you can jump off and grab leaves. So this is a race game as a sloth. You're trying to be the first person to get nine of your leaves that are scattered all over this board. 
Now, every time you play the game, you're going to use a different random set of the different animals. Uh, for our one play of this, we played with four players. We used the uh, uh, suggested starting setup of animals. So we had like ants and a donkey. There was an elephant. There was a unicorn. So uh, very authentic animals going on in the game. Uh, there were also alligators and eagles. And the uh, structure of this game is really quite simple. Um, at the start of every turn, you are going to draw a certain number of cards from these stacks of uh, cards that are associated with the different animals. And and the key is you can never draw two cards from the same stack, and those stacks are sorted with the um, lowest power cards on the top and the highest power cards on the bottom. So after you have done that, maybe you have to draw three cards, so you take like an ant card, an eagle card, and a donkey, then you have to play cards from your hand, and you can play up to as many cards as you want to, as long as they are all the same type of animal. So that means on the first turn, if you draw three different cards, because they have to be different, then you're just playing one card, and you're uh, saving the other two in your hand. So maybe you play the donkey, and the donkey card just has a one or a two movement on it, and you move a donkey over, and it comes next to you, you jump onto the back of it, and it moves a little bit farther, so it kind of progresses you on your path, and that's it. Your turn is now done, and the next player goes. Now the next time it's your turn, you have these two cards still remaining in your hand, you have to draw three more cards, and now maybe you get another ant and another eagle, and you get something else, and now maybe you play two ants, and now you're trying to save up to get a really big eagle turn, and that is kind of the flow of this game. You're trying to have the right number of animal cards at the right time to do stuff. Now, each one of these animals does different things. Uh, for instance, the alligators, uh, when you play, um, I believe it was at least one alligator card, you get plus one to the overall movement, but also each animal only has specific type of terrain that it can go in. For instance, the alligators had to stay in the water or one space next to the water. Uh, there were uh, other things that could not cross the water, and um, uh, by and large, it was generally just movement points, like a certain number of movement points that you do, but there were a couple that definitely broke this. Um, the eagle, you just had to get to at least six power, and it would then teleport to over wherever you are, and it would fly you six spaces over whatever. Um, there were also the ants, which are really kooky. Uh, every ant point movement that you have, you can move every single ant on the board for a single point, and then you can jump onto an ant train and kind of move along like a little slide of ants uh, with your sloth. So trying to build that up is going to be really good for you. Uh, so as you play through the game and you start collecting these leaves, you're going to put them down onto your player board. And an interesting thing happens because as you collect more leaves, you become less powerful. So it's kind of like the game has a baked in uh, slowing the leader effect. Um, as you get more leaves, which means you're closer to winning, you draw less cards and you start suddenly start to have to discard cards at the end of your turn. So um, if somebody really races ahead, they're going to get hampered to buy that, and people will have a chance to catch up. So we played a four-player game of this one, and I actually took a surprise win. I was not expecting to win this game. I felt like I was doing relatively well, but over the course of a series of turns, I kept drawing ant cards. I kept bringing those ant cards into my hand and doing other things. And then when it was finally down to me needing just one more leaf um, that I was really far away from, I had, I think, five ant cards in my hand. So at that point, I just played them out, and I moved all of these ants an incredible amount uh, to try and build all these slides and then I just kind of slid, slid, slid right into the end and I grabbed that leaf and we finished the round and I was the only person who was able to get there. Now I do think that a couple of my opponents were very close to getting to uh, their last leaf that they needed as well. Um, I can't remember if it was eight or nine leaves total, but you had to get all but one of them on the board, which I did like. Uh, that meant that as you were kind of plotting out your plan to try and get to these leaves, you could kind of take one of them and just be like, I'm just not going to go over there. Like, the animals aren't right, the, the situation isn't good, I'm just going to skip that corner, kind of jump right over there, and then get the rest of them. And I really liked that design decision. Uh, so overall, I thought the game was uh, really pleasant, honestly. Uh, it was uh, really easy to teach overall. The game kind of taught itself. It was very streamlined. It kind of just made sense in what you were doing. It was also just funny <laughs> from a thematic perspective and kind of uh, interesting, trying to piece together uh, this overall race strategy as you're all just kind of borrowing this donkey and then borrowing that donkey and uh, jumping on the back of an elephant that then throws you across the water and just all of these kind of kooky things to try and do this sloth race. Um, I think when the dust settled at the end of the game, we all had a positive impression of it, but I also don't think that any of us was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. <laughs> I think we all uh, had a good board gaming time, and I think that I might have enjoyed it the most of everyone, and I certainly could see myself playing this uh, game again. Um, there's a decent amount of other types of animals, so every time you play, you can shuffle them up and put them out, and they'll definitely change the overall flow of the game. But I don't think this is necessarily one that I will seek out to actually acquire a copy of. So um, if I have the opportunity to play this one again, I could see myself doing it. I feel like um, even six months from now, I could probably sit down and 
teach most of the rules considering how simple the gameplay is in the player board right in front of you kind of walks you through that as well. So uh, yeah, it's a neat, uh, strangely themed race game that uh, definitely worked for me. Okay, let's now move on to the fourth game I'll be discussing today, and that one is Silver and Gold. Now, this is a new release from the designer Phil Walker-Harding, who has designed uh, other famous games like Sushi Go, Baron Park, and Imhotep, among others. Uh, now, Silver and Gold is a flip-and-write style game. Uh, it comes in a very thin overall box, and the way it works is you have a deck of cards, and on each card there is a differently shaped grid of squares. Now, you're going to have uh, two of these that are face up in front of you, and we will all have those around the table, and then one player is going to flip up the random card from the top of a shape card deck. Now, they're going to flip that card over, and it's going to show uh, maybe a 1x2 type of shape, or a 2x2, or maybe an L, or a zig or zag. Now, what that means is you then, with a uh, dry erase pen, are going to mark off that shape in one of the two cards that you have in front of you. Now, what you're trying to do is actually fill in all of the spaces on a given card, because as soon as you do that, you can cash it in for points, and then you draw a new card from the middle of the table, and you try to fill that one in as well. Now, then in this uh, shape card deck, you know exactly what's in there, and every time you go through it, you will draw all but one of them. So you're not exactly sure what's going to come out at any given moment, and once you've pulled all but one, you then go into the next round where you pass that shape deck to the next player, and you do a certain number of rounds. I can't remember exactly how many it was. It was maybe four, and at the end of the game, whoever has the most points in their completed cards is going to win. Now, there are a couple other things going on. There are coins that you can cover up as you're filling in these shapes, and every time you complete a coin, you cross that off on your player board, and uh, whenever you finish a row of coins, you actually get points equal to a little track. The sooner you do that, the more points you get, and you deny those points from other players. So it's a bit of a race to fill those in, and coins are worth a point at the end of the game. Also, there are these uh, little palm trees. Now, every time you cover up a palm tree on one of your cards, you then score palm trees, and you get one point for every palm tree on uh, the, uh, the card that you just uh, uh, crossed it off of, and every palm tree showing on the uh, row of cards in the middle of the table that you can actually take new cards from. So as the game goes on, the palm tree scoring is going to fluctuate based off of uh, what cards are there in the middle. So you might find yourself uh, doing an inopportune uh, placement to try and cross off a palm tree when perhaps there's four of them showing, so that's a really big amount of points for that. Uh, so that's most of the rules to the game. Uh, some of the cards that you complete will also give you bonus points for other types of cards, so there's a little bit of a symbiotic thing going on. But um, by and large, that's the game, and I was uh, pretty enamored with it. Um, I enjoy flip and write, roll and write style games in general, and I also like puzzly, tetris -y type of games where you're trying to uh, fit things in, and this game has both of those going. And um, also just an interesting idea where you're using a dry erase pen on cards. Uh, this did mean at the end of the game you had a bunch of cards you had to like erase off, which was a little bit annoying. But overall, I really liked the uh, pacing of the game. I think after the rules were taught, it took about 30 minutes to teach. I really enjoyed the decisions that were made as we were trying to fill all these things in. And it's worth noting, you, uh, you are allowed to kind of overlap where you've been before. So it's not super punishing, you might place down a shape and just cross a couple things off instead of uh, the four that you might have done before to try and fill things in because of how things went. But obviously, that's less efficient, and the more times you do that, the, the more you're going to fall behind from your opponents. Uh, so yeah, I, I honestly don't really have much else to say. We played a four-player game of it. We played it once. I really liked what was going on. Uh, I like the fact that the game is so small. It's like a box about this big and like that skinny. And I am uh, pretty tempted to go buy a copy of this one, honestly. I have quite a few roll and slash flip and write style games. But um, I really liked how this one played. I really liked the size of it overall. Um, everyone seemed to enjoy it as they were playing. It was nice and breezy. We actually played this while we were in line to sign up for the game show at Board Game GeekCon. Uh, the line to sign up for the show that's the next day can sometimes get pretty long. So we sat down about 45 minutes before the sign up started and we just, we pulled a table over and we played this entire game while uh, trying to kill that time. And uh, through the course of setting it up, teaching it, and playing it, it was about 45 minutes. We uh, finished up, we scored, and then uh, we, we got to the front of the line. So it really worked out well overall. And uh, yeah, that's Silver and Gold. It's a fun game. 
All right, we've now reached the fifth and final game I'll be talking about today, and this one is The Magnificent. Now, this is a new design from Aporta Games, and the designers of this game are, I believe, the same set of designers who did Santa Maria, which came out uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, now, much like Santa Maria, uh, The Magnificent uses dice, and this is a medium to a little bit heavyweight Euro game about trying to manage a uh, carnival circus tent type of situation. Uh, now, before I go into the specifics, I'm just going to start right off at the beginning and say I only played this one once at Board Game Geek Con, but it uh, was one of the stars of the show. Uh, I loved this game. I played it with my friends Matt and Claire, and um, I believe for both of them, this was the best game that they played at the convention, and they played the other ones that I loved, like Maracaibo and uh, uh, Marco Polo 2. Uh, for them, The Magnificent was, was amazing, and I super liked it too, although Maracaibo is a little bit better um, for me. Uh, but anyway, let's talk about how The Magnificent works. Now, uh, you're going to play through three rounds in this game, and you're going to roll a big pile of dice. Uh, there are orange, purple, green, and then clear dice. Now, when it's your turn, you are going to draft one of the dice from the middle of the table, and then you will take actions. Now, in front of you, you have four of these cards, and you're going to put a die on top of one of those cards, and then you will have some sort of modification or bonus. Uh, maybe you'll take a purple die and put it onto the card that says plus two pips if this happens to be a purple die. So you took a purple four and now it acts like it's a purple six and then you get to do an action. Now there are three different actions that you get to do in this game. Uh, you can uh, use an action to take these little tetris -y kind of tetramino tiles and you then cover up spaces within your uh, player board that's in front of you. And whenever you cover up bonuses, you get those bonuses immediately. Now the next thing that you can do is you can push these little caravans around these tracks. There are three tracks for the three main colors in the game, and the amount of pips of dice that you have is going to be the number of times you move around those tracks, and when you move, you're going to get gems of a variety of colors, as well as uh, the potential of getting some more circus tents, which increases your ability to put on shows. Now, the third thing that you can do with your action is put on a show. Now, the way this works is you're going to have these poster cards in front of you, and you're going to have them uh, face up in, uh, near your player area. Now, the number of tents that you have is the number of shows that you can put on, but you also have to have enough pips to get to that point. There's a big track going down the middle of the board, and I can't remember specifically, but let's say you want to put on a show with two uh, circus performers, then you might need to get to eight pips worth of power. If you want to put on a show with three performers, you might need to get to 12 or 13. If you want to put on a show with all five performers, you have to get to like 20 power worth of pips. Uh, now, I'll talk about how that's possible in just a second, but the way the shows work is the actual posters show you the type of Tetramino polyomino type tiles you need on your player board to actually do that event. So each tile, like this one might, right here, might say you need two of the T shape. Um, now, if you look down and you have those two, then great. That means that performer can perform. They will give you some points. They will probably give you some money. And the tent um, that they're in will probably give you some sort of bonus as well. Um, now, uh, what you're trying to do is piece all these things together to get you a bunch of points. And as you can see, just going through those three main actions, you can see how this is all going to work. Obviously, you have to build out these tiles to give you bonuses. The tiles need to match up with the posters that you have for the acts that you want to put on and perform. And then running uh, around the tracks is going to give you a bunch of gems. And I didn't talk about it just yet, but gems are used in, uh, in a few different ways to uh, make things better. I'm not going to go into all of those specifics, but you definitely like to have gems. Um, now, at this point, I want to circle back over to the dice because you might be wondering how by taking a single die are you going to get to 18 or 20 pip value. Now, when you draft a die, you actually get a number of activations or pip values equal to all of the dice of that color in front of you. So if your first draft uh, has you taking a purple five and your second draft has you taking a purple three, then with that second draft, you don't do a purple three action, you do a purple eight action because you already had that five. With your third draft, if you take a purple four, you now do a, uh, a 12 pip value action because you have all of these. So obviously you are really incentivized to try and take the same color die over and over again to, the, to do these massive actions. Now, the game has a baked in uh, mechanic to stop you from that because at the end of each one of the three rounds, you have to pay for your dice. Now, what you do is you look down in front of you and you find the color of dice that you have the most pips in and you pay one coin for every pip in that die. So that means if you spend the whole round just taking these purple dice, you might have 
18 pips worth of stuff and you have to spend 18 money and you do not have 18 money and that means you're going to start losing points which is obviously not something that you want to do. Uh, now, hypothetically, you do have that 18 money because you used all of that power to do a bunch of really cool stuff that gave you points and the money that you needed to pay that off and obviously you should be careful with doing that. This also means if you are in money problems, maybe you'll take like a purple 2, a green 3, and an orange 4 and you just pay 4 money at the end of the round. Now, there is an asterisk here because there are also those clear dice and they act as wild dice when you uh, activate them. Now, at the end of the round, you always have to pay for all of your clear dice. So um, that's just something you have to keep in mind. Uh, now, that's essentially the game. There's actually a decent amount of other stuff going on with some assistants, which give you bonus actions and you can unlock new assistants, but I don't think I need to go into those specifics. Now, as I said before, I played a three-player game of this one, and we all loved this game. It was one of the best games of the convention for me and the best game of the convention for uh, both of my opponents. And um, I can't remember, actually, if I won this game. I was in a huge lead, and then I think Claire caught back up in a really big way. She might have actually edged me out. But we really enjoyed the process of thinking through how we were playing this game. I mean, you play three rounds, and in each round you draft four dice. So that means you're only taking... 12 actions in the entire game, and yet it seemed like we did so much. Uh, there was uh, competition for different posters because you're trying to go for some other things that give you points, which I'm trying not to talk about in too many specifics. Uh, you are competing for the, uh, uh, the the spots that actually let you do the performances, uh, which might actually uh, force you into spending more than you want. Let's say you want to do a performance of uh, two of your posters and somebody goes to the minimum one for that. That means you have to use more pips to go on top of them, which means you're spending more money, which obviously you don't like because if you don't have enough money, you lose uh, points. Um, now, there is one super cool mechanic, which I do think I should not gloss over, and that is at the end of each round, each player is going to get a new little bonus token, which unlocks an assistant ability, which is nice, little perky things like money or bonuses. Um, but then you also take a new action card. Now, when you do this, you take the card, and then in front of you, you have four action cards already. Remember the four cards that you put the four dice that you drafted on. Now, at this moment, you have to score one of those four cards. On the bottom of the cards, there is a conditional scoring uh, um, uh, mechanic, and they uh, run the gamut. Some of them just say, get eight points. Other ones might say, get you know two points for every one of a uh, uh, the same type of poster that you've uh, completed. Uh, one that I had said, uh, multiply the number of clear dice power that you have this round by two and get that many points, which... Um, was a lot of points because I took a lot of clear dice, but that round I had to pay so much money because clear dice are expensive. Now, when you cash out and get the points for that card, you then get rid of it and you put the new card down, which means you have a new uh, scoring objective and you have a new action. So that means at the end of each one of these rounds, you are actually picking and choosing what the new thing is. And uh, that's just super cool. <laughs> uh, obviously, you are kind of cultivating the extra actions and bonuses. Maybe it lets you change the color of the die that you're activating or set the die to whatever side you want to do or just give money or get new posters and that kind of thing. And I just thought that was super cool because it means every single round, you're gunning to try and maximize one of your scorings. And then at the end of the game, you score everything in front of you for 50% of their point value. So that means you just have a lot of things that you are paying attention to and you're cultivating the actions as you're going through that game. You're getting lots of bonuses as you're covering things up with this puzzly thing that you're doing and you can get points for that as well. There's just a lot of wonderful things to think about and um, it left all of us uh, uh, really singing its praises. Uh, this is a game that I, I believe I'm getting a copy of. Uh, a Porta has told me that uh, it's actually in the mail but it got caught up in uh, customs so uh, it should be showing up and I am actively looking forward to playing this one more. It was a super cool experience. I love dice drafting in general, and the way that system worked just felt very fresh to me, that push and pull of trying to get a lot of the same color, but other people are taking it away from you, and can you even pay for it? It was just a lot of really awesome stuff to think about. I think our three-player game took probably closing on two hours, so there was a decent amount of time put into it, but downtime did not really feel like it was a problem because I was always thinking about what I was going to be doing next. So uh, yeah, uh, The Magnificent is a wonderful game overall, and I'm actually looking forward to many more plays. Well, that's going to bring us to the end of this impressions vlog. I have successfully talked about 15 of the uh, games that I've played over the last few weeks. I'm really working through an overall backlog. Uh, I have a decent amount more, and I'll be recording a few more of these and sprinkling them out throughout the month of December. So December is kind of like impressions month overall here at John Gets Games, and I hope you've enjoyed uh, the games, uh, learning about the games I've talked about today, and definitely keep your eyes out for the next ones that are coming down the pipe. 
As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including all of these producer-level Patreon backers. If you too would like to directly support the channel and the creation of videos like this one, then please go to johngetsgames.com support to see a variety of ways with which you can do that. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button down below as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.